So for this essential biodiversity variable, what data resources exist? That's a question. I've taken you to the Geobon page before. Um, here they're describing species population data. I won't read more of this to you, but definitions of species population EBVs. The essential biodiversity variable for species distributions is the probability of occurrence over contiguous spatial and temporal units addressing the global extent of a species group consisting of one to many members. That's an interesting thing. What is probability of occurrence? Is it probability that the conditions are right for the species? Is it probability that I'm within the range of the species? Is it probability if I go there that I will find the species? None of that is clear, okay? But, and then the other species population EBV, the one that's about, oh, here we go. Is the essential biodiversity variable for species abundances is the predicted count of individuals over contiguous spatial and temporal units. So one of them is about this unclear, undefined probability of occurrence, probability that the species is there, and the other is about what's the average number of individuals that I'm likely to find there. Okay? Huh? Occupancy would be about the first one. What's the probability that it is there? But I'm always kind of uncomfortable with those probabilities. And I'm going to give you guys this paper. You can read it. It's about um, essentially a vision for how you would manage the data for these, um, for this EBV. It hasn't really been implemented, um, although I'll show you a data portal that is uh, maintained by one of the people, one of the authors of this paper, and you can tell me whether you think it's been implemented. Um, but essentially, this is this is branching out above uh, different EBVs and saying how would you store information about species ranges. But let's go into the actual databases, right? The places where we can go and get data. So. The one that I used in a paper a few years ago, the Global Population Dynamics Database, uh, and it's maintained by NCES, which is the, in the US, the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis, and by the Center for Population Biology at the Imperial College of London. Don't write it down. You go there now, and here's what you get. Oops, it's offline. I tried from several portals, tried over several days. Oops. Okay, um, this is a US specific one. This is our LTER network, long-term ecological research. And it's a network of sites. And they do have data available for download, but it's only for U.S. and so I, I was interested in one genus of rodent. So I looked for peromiscus and population. It's two keywords. And here's what I get: you know, mark recapture of rodent and shrew populations in a declining hemlock stand at Harvard Forest in 2012. Impact of urbanization on small rodent abundance and community composition somewhere in Arizona. Survey of small mammals using trapping data on Virginia coast barrier islands. You get lots of information and none of it is comparable. Our LTER network made a terrible mistake of basically allowing each LTER site to use its own methodologies for population data. Here's what one of the data packages looked like. It shows you where, 
It gives you nice metadata. So it's, it's data that are quite usable, but you're going to have a hell of a time putting them together across the range of a species. Here's another common um, place where population data are, are stored, called Dryad. And again, this is heterogeneous data sets. There's no common format. There's no common language. And so it would be a massive amount of work to merge together different data sets. So really, the, probably the best source that presently exists, remember that that previous one no longer exists, at least to my knowledge, are these compadre and comadre databases. If you know Spanish, it means um, your compadre is your, the godfather of your children, and your comadre is your, the godmother of your children. Um, not really sure why it's called that, or they're called that, but these are not necessarily population data, but they are population matrix data. So matrix population models for tens of, thou tens of thousands of matrix population models. <coughs> and there's a bunch, they, they're applicable to a bunch of species. Compadre is for plants and comadre is for animals. But again, this isn't actual empirical data. It's matrix population models that have been fit to actual data. And so you can, you can go in and you can query and you can see that they have, oops, 421 species, 640 studies, and 2,280 matrix population models. Okay? I'm, I'm just looking on the, on the internet for population data sets. I found this one. Uh, Reef Ed Environmental Education Foundation, and this does have, well, distribution reports, batch reports, which are the results of trips and, and expeditions, geographic area reports, but again, not really population data. So your biggest source is GBIF. Notice this astounding number. I got to be present when the first distributed data set for biodiversity was assembled. And it was basically connecting two institutions, it would have been about 1997, 1998 maybe, and it was spectacular and that was 100,000 records, 200,000 records, and now look, it's 1.3 billion records that you can query right now. But those are heterogeneous point data. They have a common architecture, so they're very well integrated. Okay, we call the data architecture Darwin Core. Okay, it's a format for organizing species occurrence data. So it's really, really nice in the sense that these data are all pretty much in exactly the same format, but Having a lot of points of a species here and very few points of that species here may mean that you have a lot of observers here. Or it may mean that you have no internet connectivity over here. Or it may mean that the species is genuinely more abundant here. Or not. So you have to use these data intelligently. You can see the... Um, differences in data density. This is not a very sensitive map because their categories are, are rather broad. But you can see very dense coverage across Europe and North America. Then you can see some of those circles getting smaller in Africa, especially Asia, and especially in marine realms. You like that map, Amelie? <laughs> <laughs> Remember you guys learned that you never, ever, 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 ever present a Mercator map? Look at how big Greenland is. No wonder Trump wanted to buy it, right? <laughs> and 
And then there are issues of data quality. I've already shown you guys this, but this is a search for Rwanda. Okay? And anybody know, well, I don't, it, this, this is actually referring to a point there. Anybody know what that place is? It is the most commonly sampled place on Earth for biodiversity data. I'm, I'm going to put it right about there, but it's within this square. Come on. Where is London in reference to that? There's London, and particularly not London, but Greenwich. Greenwich, sorry. Right? No, you're right. I mean, it's in London. You can take the, the subway there. What's that? When we talk about Greenwich Mean Time, what are we talking about? Now, the equator runs like this. The prime meridian is zero longitude. And the equator is zero latitude. Now, when you are recording a datum and you don't have data for, for something, you could put, you know, no data, but a very common and unfortunate trend has been to put zero, zero. And so literally, the best sampled place on Earth, look, look at Amelie's face. <laughs> Can we get a, a recording of our geographer? I'm joking. <laughs> Let's get a recording of our geographer crying. So that is something that biologists do when they are tasked with recording geographic information. Um, so yeah, amongst these Rwandan records, we have things that are too far east and too far south. We have one who God knows how it, it managed to be in coastal southern Peru, and one in, in Australia. But that's, that's life when you deal with big data sets. Okay, I love to make fun of biologists for doing this, but that's life. And any time you guys deal with a data set that's bigger than maybe 10 records, it has errors in it. Yeah. And it's up to you to find them or at least to use methods that don't get confused by them. So, again, I'm painting a fairly bleak picture for you, but species population data are rather sparse. So, Questions about that? Wow. Killed that one. There we go, Emily. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> you want, want the map back or something? No, it's about, so, so I get why you would use primary species occurrence data, but which species do you pick and why? Ah, very good question. To me, that depends on your, on your um, objectives. If you're interested in endangered species and species extinction, then maybe you know, those threatened and endangered species are a good place to start. You know, and not Lantana camera or, or you know, global invasive species. Right? Um, but you may have a very different set of objectives. You may be interested in, um, you know, I'm managing such and such national park and I want to know if, um, you know, what is my load at present and in the future of invasive species or of species that dominate land cover and, and ruin, you know, natural uh, vegetation types. So the beautiful thing about uh, primary data is that you have the potential to make customized products that respond exactly to your situation. If you use these secondary products, you are essentially confined to, well, I have information about conservation threat status transitions, and I have information about vertebrate population trends. When I compare 
the genome composition and this as a variable for me i think species population is a fairly useful one for working within the areas that some of us work with because you, you're able to compare and get references even beyond your our own small scope without a doubt yeah without a doubt the you know where the the genetic composition comes in is mostly where you're in situations of intensive conservation attention and then there is some thought that species that have been bottlenecked or have been at very low population sizes may have lost so much genetic variation that they're no longer able to respond to change via evolutionary adaptation. So that's where it would come in, you know. Imagine some of the species that are really, really rare in the, in the uh, very intensively monitored uh, ecosystems. Right, because I'm looking at species populations and if we increase, I'm thinking even for my country, Kenyan space, if we increase just the observations for presence data, we're able to still get more useful of course. systems. I, ag I agree with you 100%. Another question, Kevin. Uh, I just wanted to know that within our own African continent, don't you have uh, a threat assessment organization? Do I? No. <laughs> but does, do, does the world... Um, no, like the world probably. The so m most, most countries have some sort of list. Um, they are often very poorly conceived, including the U.S. list. I wrote a scathing criticism years ago because the U.S. endangered species list includes species that exist only in the U.S. and are endangered. It includes species that are mostly in the U.S. and are endangered, you know, which is to say you conserve their populations in the U.S. or they're gone. But then also it includes things like Everglade kite or Aplomato falcon that are neotropical species and have a population in the US like this, just a, you know, the very northern edge of their population, of their distribution, is in the US. What a ridiculous waste of money to be putting conservation attention to species where we had peripheral populations to begin with. They may not even have been viable populations. So those national threat lists are really heterogeneous, they're very perilous. I don't, I don't like having to refer to them very much. So mostly, you know, if you were to do an Africa-wide list, you'd be taking subsets of the global list, okay? The question is, do you have critical mass to essentially create Africa's own list? And how would you do that? You know, and it would be an interesting exercise because you'd come to those same national problems of what do I do with a species that's mostly Asian but is present you know, on the coast of Egypt or in the Sinai Peninsula? Or what do I do with a species that, um, that has a few records in Africa but is mostly somewhere else? You know? And so you're, you're gonna run up against the same things and really the most important thing that an Africa-wide committee or Africa-wide effort would do is to improve the information about the African endemic species. And so it would be repeating the same work, but maybe with better information. Okay?